Enabling people from developing countries to have a chance to benefit from the internet and contain the digital divide is still very relevant. The sacrifice has been great, but the rewards and benefits for generations for people in the developing world who would otherwise have missed the opportunity has been limitless. Professor Ni Quino. When this quote was made, it was not made by a bystander giving an assessment on global issues and an opinion on how things ought to be. This was the lived reality of the speaker, for indeed it was made by a man who facilitated the introduction, the development and the expansion of the internet in Africa. Professor Ni Nakukweno, nicknamed the father of the internet in Africa, is a Ghanaian scientist, engineer and professor who journeyed for almost two decades in his quest to enable internet access in Africa. Particularly because of the work we do at the Center for Journalism, Innovation and Development and at Dubawa where we fight information disorder, misinformation, disinformation, which are all abuses of the internet. Spotlighting Professor Queno today on World Internet Day, that's as a world of good. So today we are here to sit with Prof to get the facts from a man who has enabled all of us to be internet users in Africa. So Prof, um, take us back down memory lane. Tell us a bit about how you started with your education and then move a bit to your career. Hmm. Okay, I went to uh, a school now that you guys call Kimbu, but it was called government school, and uh, entered at the Saddle College around uh, with maybe 61, with class of 66 or something like that. Then I did my sixth form at um, Achimota School, and uh, I had a one year stint trying to do pre med, which was a fiasco. And then I proceeded to the U.S. and I was at Dartmouth College and uh, eventually at Stony Brook uh, University of uh, New York at Stony Brook for my PhD, which I concluded in 77. But after working in industry for just two years, I decided to come to Ghana to teach at University of Cape Coast. And that puts it around 79 or so. But uh, I, I had some challenges um, driving the system the way I wanted. So I left around 82. Um, then I turned around and came back in 88, which is perhaps the era that um, we had a brief discussion on. And there, my intention was to move the private sector because I had already done some work in building some skill sets at the University of Cape Coast. So, uh, it's from the 88 activity of the uh, network computer systems that resulted in the internet. In, uh, th that activity started from about 88 until December 93. And so by January 94, we were then offering some services on the tiny line I was telling you about. Um, and then eventually uh, we had you know, faster links including satellites and so on. So that's roughly how it went, yeah. Okay, so take us from the, your transition from medical school <laughs> to computer, learning about computer science. Yeah. Take us through that. How was that transition for you? And how did you know this is what you wanted to do? Okay, the thing is, um, sometimes for, for students who are doing well, it's difficult for them to choose what it is that they like. Because in my O level, I did very well in all of these subjects, including biology and everything. Um, but when I went for sixth form, I did not do zoology. Instead, I carried four courses, you know, physics, pure math, math you know, applied math and chemistry. And I got three A's and so on. Um, but notice I've missed the biological side. So even though I was desirous of being in medical school and went to pre-med and all that, um, I got referred and uh, it shook me. But it also made me understand because I myself, I knew I did not like cutting the, the dogfish. I ended up cutting all the veins and blood all over the place. So it was not exactly for me, but the physics, oh, I'll do all the measurements for you, 
math, I'll solve all the problems, chemistry, I was okay. Um, so it was clear that the biological sciences were not my way. Um, so the first opportunity I got, I changed. Fortunately, I went to a school that was spearheading computing in general, which is a Dartmouth College. At that time, in believe it, in the US. At that time, we had terminals in dormitories. Hmm? And they are all connected by wire to some central machine that we all use. And uh, I was so fascinated by that thing that I, I went and found myself a job there as a cleaner. Uh, I used to collect the paper. You know, this typewriter, it has a spool of paper, so paper pieces all over the place, and it has some tape, which it has holes, so there are pocket holes all over. So I got myself a job as a cleaner. Then I rose and I became a terminal room assistant, the one who is helping people to find archaeological things or uh, anthropology things and so on. Uh, then eventually I became assistant programmer there and, and so on and so forth. Then started writing programs about uh, heart waves and, and things of that sort, distributed systems and so on. That's how it went. Yeah. Okay, so when you, this was before 88, when you came yes. to Ghana to yes. be a teacher in the University of Cape Coast, yes. you're not going to forget that you set up, you instituted the Department of yes. Computer Science. Yes. You made that possible, the University of yes. Cape Coast. And I still teach there. And you still teach there? Yes. Okay, so um, after that, mm -hmm. you left the country. Yes, I left. And 82, I came back at 88. And that's when you went to the, back to work in the industry? Yes, I went back to work in the same job I had left to come here. Oh, the same job? Same job at Digital okay. Equipment Corporation. I was a very senior, very, very senior engineer there. I left finally as a senior engineering manager with over 60 employees, yes. Wow. Sure. Okay. Several PhDs. So, what made you want to come back to Ghana? Okay. What made you want to leave the US and come back? Now, if you were the first um, PhD in some special area, um, would you, uh, knowing that your country had none of it, would you have been able to comfortably stay outside there? So it was more of wanting to help the country? Uh, there is some burden on you, knowing that the gap is there, knowing that the divide is there. I understood the digital divide in a way that no other person could have understood mm. at that time. So would I have been able to live with myself? No. Meanwhile, I was spending my time teaching in uh, International Center for Physics, teaching physicists how to interface with measurement tools. Uh, I taught even in Sri Lanka. I taught in mainland China, you know, Academia Sinica, you know, and I taught in uh, Mexico, and on and on and on, see. I taught in Ghana to the Atomic Energy Commission on the same microprocessor thing. So there was a certain pressure in my mind that if you are the first from here, knowing that there's nothing here and you have gotten a chance to know, um, you should do something about it. I didn't want to accept that selfishness that I have learned and I've made my money and I'm happy. No, no. I. I wanted to come and try to do something about it. I, I was not kidding. I knew that it was not going to be easy. Because I had the experience at the University of Cape Coast before. But I was happy I produced students, graduates. Okay? So the second time, the step was to try and push it industrially. So I was representing my, the company I was working with, Digital Equipment Corporation and providing solutions to enterprises you know, in, in Ghana, okay. um, like VRA and so on and so forth. Um, so, so around that time, it was evident that um, after the enterprise, what next? Meaning when your company now has internal use of all the things you expect of computers, you can talk to somebody far away, but in your particular, what's next? is to connect these networks. And that is what we did to create the internet. We changed the standard we're using. Instead of the proprietary DECnet standard, um, we went to the open TCP IP standard, and then we built the internet to connect all these people. So it was grew from the ground. 
Yeah. So that's how you started. That's how, yeah. would you say that's how you introduced the internet yes. to Ghana first? Yes. And then how did you um, get to the other part ah, of the continent? Okay. We had a philosophy that we want, did not want to go to any other country. We wanted to help people in that country connect their countries so that they can carry on like I've been talking about adding to it. So, for example, um, Gambia, you mentioned, um, we actually installed the first ISP there as an investment with uh, a group called Quantum Net. They are now QCell. They are the cellular provider in uh, uh, Gambia. So notice that different countries handle their pioneers differently. We also then helped Nigeria. There was a, a company called Linkser, yeah, Chima. And uh, we showed him where we connect to. You know, in business, you don't show people your sources, right? But the, the, <laughs> the atmosphere in our, our environment was liberation, techno liberation. Okay, we're in a techno liberation struggle. Um, uh, you know, Mandela. For most of us, that were not in that era. What was the whole techno liberation about? Okay, we knew. Uh, you you know what it is. We knew that what is has happened was going to happen, but we tried to delay it and fend it off as long as we could. By techno liberation, what we mean is that. We want um, to be liberated from technology being used to control our economy or our society. You know, as if you don't know anything about it, it has sufficient power that it can be used to give us problems. Even the disinformation is enough power. Um, so we wanted to wage a war that said that we did it ourselves. So between when Mandela was released in 1992 uh, to 2000, we had connected all of the continent. And it was a grand you know, collaboration, not only us, but different other agencies. Some UN groups were involved, some international organizations, internet society provided a lot of training and so on and so forth. Um, so that was the, the, the other one. Uh, I mean, you have seen the comment on Gambia, Nigeria, um, Sierra Leone, oh, Liberia, very interesting one. Liberia, there was a lady called Meure who used to work at Ashanti Gold Fields here. And when she was leaving to go back to her country, she wanted to start email service. Okay, so we arranged for an engineer to set it up for, for her, and then we allowed their mail to pass through us. Same as Togo. Togo mail, email used to pass through us for some time. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yes. Liberia passed through here. Togo mail passed through here for some period of time till they also got their own infrastructure and so on and so on. The one that we knew they were having challenges, but we never were able to connect properly was Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, most of them had the same. Some of them, Quantum Net, I mean, Gambia, they were trained. Um, and uh, a United Nations program called Internet Initiative in Africa. And them in Swazi and Ethiopia were somehow um, brought to, you know, get involved in what we were doing at the time. How many years did it take for you to finally say, oh, we've done it, we've, you know, from when you started providing this internet, internet uh, services to these countries? How many years did it take for all these African countries for you to find Okay, the thing is, at that time, we were, <laughs> it's difficult to define what it means to have internet. Mm -hmm. At that time, um, if you do not have a connection, one connection in the capital city, okay. you did not have internet. Okay. okay, so by saying you are connecting meant that there was some equipment in the country that made the internet available locally. Okay. okay. And uh, between the first such connection, I think, may have been, uh, they always fight about it, Tunisia, whether it's Tunisia or South Africa. Mm -hmm. I suspect it's about so the same. 
No, first on the continent. Yeah. Oh, we started like from South Africa, Tunisia, oh. Ghana. But by, by the time we reached 2000, every capital city had a connection. Okay. Now, the area where my role was, which people don't quite see, is the internet needs institutions to support it. And all these technical institutions um, had something to do with me in when they were formed. Like, uh, if you want to have internet, you need numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you go for the numbers? The institution that you go to call Afrinic, for example, I was the founding chair. It took me 10 years to, to build it, but I'm not part of it anymore. Uh, that one is my way. I build and I move on. There was one for the uh, .tg, .ke, the names. It's called AFTLD. Uh, that also, I was involved in its founding and I moved on. Um, there's one which is like a community for operators, regionally, so that people who are ISPs anywhere can come together and, and train each other, a training kind of facility. That also, I, you know, and the emergency response teams, the research and education networks, and so on and so forth. I was the chairman of West African and Central Africa Research and Education Network till last year. So what were some of the challenges you encountered, or was it easy? Well, the challenge is um, how to make people let you do what you do, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, the first time we announced that um, uh, we have e-commerce and you can pay for things with CDs, I got visit, a call from a minister and a visit from somebody from the bank. Some example. Um, you know, f first, after internet connection, uh, there were journalists who doubted that uh, we had internet. Big names, eh? And went on the rampage, but eventually came to the office and they saw it was there. Um, people were using it at that time to bash the existing government. You know, as they will, they will write their stories, they have their way of sending it to somebody somewhere in the US, then he will put the disinformation or whatever it is there. Uh, then government officers will come to me and say, why don't you take them off and why don't you do this? And I have to tell you that that's not how it works and that I'll help you get your information out there. Yeah. So that when people look for it, then they will see both and they can form their own. So, I mean, there are lots of challenges. Um, why was I paying so much money for 9.6 kilobits? As if if you make the price like that, then I will not do it. No, I'll do it. I'll do it. All I had to do was <laughs> count the total amount and see the customers I have and share the money on them. And so every time, I got more customers, price became better. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. uh, so I can compete. See, as the number of users are increasing, my price will be coming down. It will be coming down, and I'll be investing and so on and so forth. So those are the kinds of, and the capacity is constantly there. Mm -hmm. Because you see good potential, but then you have to work it up. So when we hire engineers, we know it will take us 18 months before we get them to a good point, okay? So we don't send a fresh engineer to a customer. Remember, we have enterprise, so we have servers and things there. If you send someone from a university, maybe engineer, electrical engineer, you have to have built him up for 18 months before. So it means we'll be lagging behind. Um, even the customer, sometimes when they call you, it's because they have not turned on their modem. But the way they will shout at you, eh? and on and on and on. You see, so there are challenges were everywhere. But uh, I mean, uh, for me, I take it as normal. The ones that are most difficult is uh, the regulatory environment not um, accepting to let the industry lead and them kind of guide. Um, 
because this industry is too fast. You, you cannot know. Even I don't know. See, but I know it's important. So I'll keep my finger on it. And I'll be studying it. I'll be trying to get in. You know, because I wanted to do some. So those are all difficult challenges, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Difficult challenges. Would you say people were supportive of their vision? Because I'm thinking at the time, could you see into the future? Did you know how much of a big deal the internet would be now? Or you thought it was something like that was just a phase? OK. Uh, we knew it was big. That is why we said techno liberation struggle. Yeah. We knew it was big and it can be used to control us. Mm -hmm. And even at the beginning, we saw some of the sharks who come and then they will try to offer you uh, some cable which doesn't exist. If you pay money, you lose. That means that, you know, it can be dangerous. We knew and we saw all these things. So uh, we felt we had to participate. And also the internet has this thing that if you're in a community, we tend to kind of respect each other to some extent because we went open, so to speak. And, and so that was a chance because you're in open, nothing in the internet pre ever prevented us from having our peace. See, that's why you have a GH. Because by, by the designers, you ought to have existed. So there is no barrier at all. The barrier is us. But to go and get a GH, you must have to show expertise. See, you have to show that you know how to do it. And many a time, that's what we, 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 we don't quite have. And it goes on and on and on. All of these things require some, some background in being in some network. And when you're in the network, you have to behave, otherwise you get a bad reputation. And it's global networks, it's not here. Here, there was nothing. You now have to create your whole community. You see, that is why you have internet society and all these groups that have emerged and so on and so forth. Uh, it was interesting uh, anyway. So, um, while you were facilitating the introduction of the internet, yes. you were also at the same time um, helping people to be computer literate. Yes. I suppose. Sure. Okay. So, did you in any way foresee the abuses of the internet? Did you prepare for it? Did you and your colleagues prepare for internet abuses in any way? You know, like cyber scam, all the cyber crimes we have, and now. Um, misinformation online and all that. It was always there. It was always there. It was always there. The medium in which they were, were different. At that time, was email was the transport, right? So you have never got an email for a Nigerian advance fee fraud. <laughs> it were there. The misinformation was always coming. It's like a newsletter, right? But it's in text. It was always coming. So, I mean, <laughs> spam. It was always there. It would be the same way if you were in um, a typical country where mail is delivered on the streets, you get a lot of spam, you get a lot of junk mail. It's the same. The only difference is the medium. When we didn't have bandwidth, everything was text, right? Now that you have a little bit more bandwidth, it will even come all the way on your WhatsApp, right? And so the misinformation can come there. But I'm saying it was always there. So we, we did you know, anticipate and we did have structures for dealing with some of these things. Oh, for example, if somebody has an account uh, on Ghana.com email and he's dumping spam, I know what to do, right? I can see the spam will be choking my tiny pipe. I'll quickly turn off my pipe, delete some of the mails, and then kill his account, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. You also get some of it by the people who are subscribing. You take them through some due diligence and you assess who they are and how they'll behave and so on and so forth. So yeah, we had measures. And then we also had spam filters, <laughs> meaning we used to have some filters on our mail that will, you know, pick out uh, little, little things like when you, a spammer usually doesn't specify a two address, he makes it blank, okay? Or he sends it to himself and then he puts the rest of us at the BCC. So when you notice some of these things, we also flag them and so on and so forth. There are measures, but it was for that level. Oh, there's been cyber security attacks. It's not only now. People have always been trying to break into people's accounts, username, passwords. They've been trying. Okay, it's so the industry. It's waiting it now to how many African countries are wanting to go um, down the battle of digitalization. Would you say the continent is ready for that? Well, I think the continent is late, you know, message I'm giving. I mean, 30 years 
to be at 30% penetration. I mean, you mean you can't put your mind to do it 1%, more than 1% a year? You see? Yeah, you're talking plenty, you're opening lots of things and so on, but you mean you cannot grow your penetration by more than 1% a year? It's not me to do it, you know? So, yeah, we could do more. Yeah, you've always been ready. You've always been ready. It's just that you have to build your capacity. And I ask this because mm -hmm. a lot of the argument out there is that um, we need to focus more on having basic amenities for a lot of people before we think of being digitalized in a lot of areas. Okay. Amenities. If I were using computer, don't you think I can tell where the best amenities can be placed? Take schools. I can tell you best which schools should get no more of toilets than if you didn't have computer. Because I can look at the population of the school and say, our rule is this ratio is this number of toilets. Mm -hmm. you know, as if I had data, mm -hmm. you know, I can analyze the data and make policy better. For any field, agriculture, everywhere you go, most of the time we are not collecting any data. We are very happy to say we know we have everything. But with even this 53%, if I were to ask which cities are they, then you still you have, you have plenty of talk. But you should know and realize that most of the thing is happening in the cities, not in the rural. So if you have this data and you're making policy, you make your policy to move the traffic to you know where you want it to be. Anyway, that's what I'm trying to get at. The only problems we had were largely uh, we not. Uh, being on top of our uh, our industry, so to speak, because we don't have data, we don't collect data, we don't analyze data, we don't decide with data. We decide because I'm deciding. You see? And when you do that, yes, maybe it's like toss a coin, a certain percent time you get it right, a percent time you don't get it right. But I'm saying you can do better thing by harnessing the capacity, I mean, the, the technology that you have to tell you what policies are good for you. Okay. So as an expert, how would you advise that we maximize the internet for you know um, growth in Africa as a whole, you know, economic growth? Yeah. Like well, you, you, one, you have to believe in the technology. You yourself should use it. You yourself should be committed to it. And you should be trying to do more than the normal thing that you would do. So if uh, for instance, companies, they should spend more time trying to understand the minds of their customers than simply saying, I have a product. Um, governments, yours is to encourage private sector to grow in a certain direction. So you make the policy that's hands off and let the private sector go, okay? Um, but at the same time, you should set the example of being the biggest purchaser of services so you can develop your industry. Uh, you're not going to say you will not buy anything from international companies because that's not good. You need to watch your people who are coming from um, a slightly lower gearing uh, to also rise. And you can go on all over, but it's all about having data and having the mindset to use the data to help you make policy. Okay? So if it's about STEM education for girl child, you should have your data. It's not enough to say that girls you know, are not doing uh, the subject. No. You should know why they are not doing it. Okay, because many girls were usually are doing it till a certain point in their so maybe it's the system pushing them away. What is it that you must do? Maybe you don't have enough female teachers and so on. Yeah. What I'm saying use data to help you design the policy that you need. And many a times uh, we say we are digitizing, digitizing, but but it has to be connected with you know, what you are trying to do, yeah. So I read in one of your interviews um, that you had, that you said it's not enough for us to have internet users in as much as we want to make sure everybody in Africa is connected to the internet. Mm -hmm. You said it's not enough that we have internet users. We should also focus on growing internet entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. So can you please speak a bit more on that? Okay, it's the point I keep referring to regarding the consumer side and the supply side, okay? Um, if you just continue to consume, you consume from anywhere. You will not make enough effort to add anything to it. 
But I want us to also look at it that irrespective of what profession you are in, there are things you can add to the internet. Okay, maybe it's analysis, maybe it's some reports, and maybe it's some toy, some gizmo that somebody has built, or maybe it's some categorization of things, whatever it is. Any profession should be able to find its way and add to it because it's permissionless. Nobody is going to check you. That's the one thing we have not been able to do well. Okay? And then, of course, every little thing we do, we spend all the time jubilating about it. That means it's like you are running and then you are looking behind you, you see. The guy will pass you. When you are running, oh, put it aside, go to the next round and keep going, keep going. Make it a habit of being able to do these things. So yeah, it is correct. You have to focus on the entrepreneurial, um, especially for a young economy like ours. Okay, you shouldn't just do it and put it on the shelf. That's the olden days when research were, were left there. Now, you have a vehicle to propagate that, that study that you've done. And yours would be to uh, take advantage of that and, and move on. I don't think we have done it that sufficiently yet. I think that's why a lot of people are calling themselves as content creators. They are being entrepreneurial in that sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just tell us a bit more of Ghana.com? That's mm. your company now and what you do, what internet service you provide. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Wow. This company is a remnant of the pioneering company NCS. And you may recall that the email address for our customers at NCS was Ghana.com. Okay. So when uh, we liquidated NCS as, as a result of the uh, you know, crash, um, we used the email to form a new company in 2007. And that's the company you see here. Uh, this company is not doing internet connectivity uh, like the earlier company was, uh, is doing more, you might say, soft infrastructure. So if you're a content provider, you need to have a website. So you have to come and get a domain name. And after you've got a domain name, you need to have uh, some hosting. And because these days you want to keep things quiet, you need to have some certificates, you know, that will allow you so that people cannot listen to people talking on your website and so on. So we provide these kind of soft, soft tools um, to customers. Then we also do some things in the payments area. And our flagship product there is, um, is a kiosk, a self-serve uh, device that allows you to convert um, cash, uh, because it reads our bills, convert cash to any kind of virtual service be it from transport tickets, airline tickets, uh, you know, student entertainment tickets, uh, mobile money, airtime, crypto, all that. Meaning, once it's cash to virtual, um, we, we have a mechanism for accommodating that. But we also do things in the area of, um, um, you know, payments to people's websites. Remember, we host a lot of companies. So if any company wants to receive payment, then a small plug-in from us will allow them to receive their payments. So somebody can come to their site. In other words, instead of having one big store with everybody's small, small, small store, we want each one of them to have their own store. Okay, and that's also another area we see the barriers. Most people don't want to care about their website. They don't want the webmaster giving them headaches and all these problems. So they would like use Instagram or Facebook or any of these things. But we're saying those are limited. Yes, they are expanding. Um, but if you have your own, it's better. If you yourself have your own uh, website and you're putting your things there, I, I, I think that's stronger. And if you want to receive payments from your customers there, you can also get that kind of service from us. Um, and we are futuristic, you know, we build things. I still write programs. Yeah, in fact, many of the tools here, you will see the initial piece of demonstration programs come from me. Yeah, so that's what they do here. We are an internet company, um, but we also venture into payments, um, and we are looking at some future-related things, yeah.
It's really good to know. This has been very insightful, Paul. Thank okay. you very much okay. for um, having us. And um, Professor Quino's efforts and success with bringing the internet into Africa is very laudable. And if there's anything that the internet has taught us, it is that the internet never forgets. And so today, on World Internet,